Center for the Study of the Middle East. Uh, welcome. Thank you all for coming today. Um, there is a sign-up sheet, or uh, a few sign-up sheets floating about. If you wouldn't mind signing those, we'd appreciate it. Um, they help us with our reporting duties to the Department of Education. And uh, to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, today, this afternoon, is Professor John Walbridge. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, it's my privilege to introduce uh, my uh, his former and perhaps still assistant in, in China, uh, variously known as uh, Suleiman Ma, Maru Jeff, and my housekeeper Solomon, <laughs> could not okay. master either of them. Uh, uh, Suleiman is a uh, master's student at Tsinghua University. He's a graduate of uh, Peking University, which all Peking University students and faculty will tell you is the Chinese equivalent of Harvard, uh, Tsinghua being the um, uh, slightly down market uh, Chinese equivalent of MIT. Uh, he's here working on his master's thesis on, um, on Avicenna and color, which we will hear a, an abstract. Um, Suleiman <coughs> did a great deal to make my um, time in China pleasant and uh, productive. <coughs> Please excuse me. Um, taking, making sure I got to where I was supposed to be and I didn't get lost and answering questions about anything that happened to uh, attract my attention. Um, before I turn, uh, turn the session over him, I, I would like to introduce uh, one uh, distinguished guest we have here, uh, distinguished professor uh, emeritus of history and philosophy of science, Edward Grant, who is one of the <coughs> world's great authorities on, uh, on medieval science. It's a privilege to have him with us today. So without further ado, uh, we'll turn the, uh, turn the uh, table over to uh, Suleiman to explain to you about the reality of color. Uh, thank you. Thank you for introducing me, and I uh, thank you all for attending this lecture. And I, I shall thank Cecil May and uh, Ambassador Isabel Badi and Dr. Pearson for organizing and all other people organizing this talk for me. And I shall take this opportunity to express my sincere gratitude to IU, to Nelk, and to Professor Katz, to Professor Warbridge for inviting me here as a visiting scholar. And from this short-term visit, I have learned a lot from you excellent IU people. <laughs> and I have benefited greatly from your wonderful library uh, and wonderful service. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm very uh, much honored to have so many giants uh, in my field here, as, uh, many distinguished professors here uh, as my audience. And I will base this lecture on the paper I recently wrote, uh, Avicenna on the Reality of Color. And Dr. Pearson has proofread this article for me uh, with all his uh, outstanding expertise. And I also owe this favor to my friend, Ms. Jen. And uh, Professor Özcan has found me the manuscript of Avicenna in Turkey. And thank you all for helping me. Uh, and, uh, but uh, however, as Professor Warbridge insists that I cannot keep taking advantage of you without making my own contribution. Uh, so here I am. I, I hopefully I'll try to make some genuine contribution in addition to this delicious lunch. Uh, so now let's talk about uh, color. And in this lecture, I will try to answer uh, the following question. Uh, why color matters? Um, because why we spend some time here and uh, not to enjoy our lunch and also need to listen to this uh, boring philosoph philosophical discussion of color. And uh, why, uh, since I'm majorly working in uh, uh, the field of history of philosophy, so I also talk about why philosophy of color matters. And uh, uh, since uh, there are so many philosophers, uh, uh, why you choose Avicenna? Why Avicenna's thinking of color matters to us? Well, uh, let's go to the first question, why color matters? Uh, so here are some simple answers to this question, because we can say we see color and we talk about color and uh, we use color in our life. Color is everywhere uh, in the world and in our in human experience. So it's quite common and legitimate to say that our, our world is colorful and we can see color. And color is so closely connected to the uh, human experience. Uh, it appears a lot in our literature, poem, and it's uh, 
uh, deeply connected with our emotions. Yeah, and uh, but uh, yeah, it's just quite legitimate to to claim that our world is colorful and color is so important. However, for those, uh, oh, oh, I need to add one uh, punchline. It's just uh, at least we. Whether China is red uh, makes difference, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but among among us, who those who have been uh, tortured by the uh, modern science and philosophy, they would be much more hesitated to grant this common sense. Uh, they would say, "No, um, in the strict sense, you cannot say uh, our world is colorful, because you know it's just the flaw of our natural language, uh, according to a scientific." view our world is not uh, is not colorful because you must di distinguish two kinds of color one kind is uh, the physical property of the bodies uh, which you call color and another is the appearance of this property physical properties to our mind this is what we call color in our daily language you cannot confuse these two kinds of color and actually the uh, physical property of bodies uh, cannot be cannot be uh, claimed to be color in the sense of our language. Um, but why these scientists will try to prove that we are wrong, that we are ordinary people are wrong in our language? They have some more deeper motivations, and some of you must be very familiar with the dis distinction between primary and secondary qualities developed by John Locke. And according to this view, uh, bodies have qualities, but some qualities are more primary. And the, they're, they're real, they're objective, like extension, shape, but others' qualities they are dependent on or can be fully explained away by these primary qualities. They are not that real. And actually, in the world, we, uh, the bodies only have primary qualities. Mm, and if this is still very elusive to you, and let's think about values. And uh, uh, when I say uh, Professor Warbage is a good man, and uh, the scientists will only say, oh, because uh, this sentence is true because you judge Professor Warbish to be, to be good, not because Professor Warbish he himself p participated or shared the goodness in himself. In, uh, in himself. Mm, so, so is color. And there are some other motivations for the scientists and philosophers to deny the reality of color. That is, their conception of uh, causation is much narrower than the that of the, our Asians, that they think causation only happens or necessitated by physical contact. And, but these this views uh, puzzled and worried uh, some philosophers a lot because it's this conception of uh, physical reality and its relationship to our mind will bring, uh, bring about a lot of uh, unacceptable uh, consequences like uh, some issues you might be very familiar with, like free will and consciousness of our mind. All these problems are very closely connected to this narrow conception of reality. Yeah. And now I, I will uh, turn to the third question, why Avicenna is thinking of color matters? Why you talk about Avicenna? Because the simple answer is Avicenna is all I know about. <laughs> 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 But uh, at least uh, Avicenna will interest uh, people here because Avicenna is the philosopher in the Islamic tradition. If any one of you need to have some penetrating observation of the whole Islamic civilization, Avicenna is a figure you might be, you, uh, you better be, uh, you, you'd better take seriously uh, because he's an outstanding commentator of Aristotle and most representative figure of the Arabic reception of the Greek heritage, which formed the Islamic civilization, especially its rational tradition. And in addition to its historical relevance, Avicenna is also an extremely powerful thinker in his own right. I quote uh, the distinguished professor Dimitri Gutas, who claimed that Avicenna is as great as Aristotle, even more powerful. But Dr. Pearson will disagree. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yet, uh, but Avicenna is uh, just uh, this extremely powerful thinker, and his discussion of color might be illuminating or shed some new light uh, for our contemporary discussions. And surprisingly, <coughs> we'll find Avicenna's discussion of color perception actually is surprisingly uh, refined and detailed, and uh, we can just tell it from the lens of his discussion. It occupies more than one-third of the whole book of his dynamo. 
now I will, I will, I'm more justified to turn to Avicenna's theory of reality of color. But before that, I will uh, have a very quick glance at the, at the structure of Avicenna's discussion. And his third book is constituted of eight chapters. And we can tell color issue uh, constitutes the essential part of his discussion of our visual perception. Yeah. And uh, color is very cl uh, closely connected to the light and transparency. Uh, they are all the key elements of, for our understanding of our vision. Another characteristic we can tell is Avicenna's argumentative strategy is very sophisticated and it's, uh, it's diagnostic in character and it's refutatory. It's keep refuting and denying and diag diagnosing the different rival theories. But you might, you might ask, who is Avicenna arguing against? Well, uh, he has a lot of powerful opponents. And as you can tell from the handout, the first page, text one, where the text is more complete. And some of you might uh, read the Arabic. Avicenna says, Democritus and the group of natural philosophers did not grant existence to these qualities at all. And in text one, he identifies uh, at least two groups of peoples. One is atomist, represented by Democritus. Another is Pla Platonist. And he think his central accusation is that they, they deny the reality of the perceptible qualities like color. And in the to, uh, in to say, we, may, we also find Avicenna also attribute the Protagorean thesis position to, uh, uh, to, to the atomist, the Protagorean color relativism. That, it, that is, this table is white, it's only to the particular perceivers. It's, this table might be white to me, but it's black to Dr. Pearson. And we can find this uh, in the last page of the handout that uh, I will just have a very quick glance of uh, these doctrines from <laughs> the pre-Socrates and from the, the Greek Asians. We can, f we can say uh, Democritus claim that color and uh, sweetness and bitterness, they are only by convention. It's, yeah, it's, it's, and in truth, there our world only have uh, atoms and void. And for truth, uh, Democritus claim uh, the truth lies in depths. And the famous Protagorean thesis you might be very familiar with that man is the measure of all things. Man is the measure of reality. And Plato also uh, holds some colonialism in his uh, Theatetus, that color is not something real. It's, uh, it's generated in the, in the encounter between the perceiver and the thing perceived. And also Aristotle has similar criticized of these na earlier naturalistic philosophers that they didn't address these things well. They commit some mistakes. And Avicenna is working in exactly the same context with Aristotle for diagnosing their mistake. Having this in view, we might be quite uh, justified in claiming that Avicenna has some color realism to defend. Mm -hmm. and, but this picture and this story will become more convoluted and, uh, by Avicenna's later uh, statements. And he claimed, it seems that in text two, he also deny the reality of color to some extent. And this blurs the, the whole picture and this most tough uh, part of my paper, the uh, most problematic passage I need to deal with. And here I read, and you can, you can find this text on the second page of your hand, handout. The most, uh, the key passage is the to say, and here I read, whiteness is not white and redness is not red unless it is in, in accord with this respect that you see them, and they are not in this respect unless they are illuminated. And do not think whiteness as you see it and redness and so on are existent in actuality in bodies. Wow, this f the first impression it gives me that Avicenna, do not think color really exists unless we, s we, we are actually seeing it. So how to, how, to, how to deal with this problem? And what's Avicenna's uh, exact position? And I, I think the ambiguity is due to this ex expression, whiteness as you say it. So what does he mean by whiteness as you say it? It has different, it can have multiple references. And I devise 
a uh, three reading from this white, whiteness as we say it, that color as we say it, what does that refer to? First reading is color as we say it refers to the actuality of color in the external body, qua color. And second reading, color as we say it refers to act actuality of color in the external body, qua visible. And third reading is our color as we say it refers to our mental representation of external color. Now you, you might be very puzzled, what is he talking about? What is this qua color, qua visible? Um, it's very uh, convoluted, but I will try to explain that. At least we will say visibility is not the whole story uh, color tells us. It's just part of the story. And uh, so reading A, reading B is, more, is much more stronger than reading A because uh, it claims that Avicenna here only have the color qua visible. That means the phenomenon color as we, we, have, uh, we have heard from the scientists at the right beginning of this talk that you, you must distinguish two kinds of color. One is color in the body, the other is a phenomenon color. And this color qua visible is more like the phenomenon color, that the color we are actually seeing. And the reading A will claim, actually Avicenna do not have this uh, distinction here. He just mean, he just refers to the very generally the color qua color, that color in the body, regardless of whether it is seen by us or not. And reading C is different from the first reading. It, uh, reading C will make uh, Avicenna's claim uh, very trivial that uh, Avicenna just said, color as we say it refers to our mental representation of external color. So color exists in our mind and not in the bodies. It's, uh, it's here and not there. So we'll have a little detailed explanation of these three readings. First reading, we'll hold that Avicenna, as I said, Avicenna do not hold this distinction here. And as you see in the text, Arabic text, or the, the translation I give, and reading A, we will also read this conjunction and between these two clauses here as exegetical. That means Avicenna said, uh, it is in accord with this respect that you see it, and they are not in this respect unless they are illuminated. By this end, Avicenna further, ex uh, further explained that, oh, by this respect you s that you see it, I mean uh, they are illuminated. So being illuminated is the only condition of color to be actual. And color B will disagree, and his color B will claim that Avicenna do have this distinction here, that this color, as we see it, it refers to the actuality of color quite visible, that we actually, color, uh, only when we are actually seeing color, color is real. But, uh, but reading B will also leave it open that whether uh, this two actuality of color. One is actuality of color qua color, the other is actuality of color qua visible. What's the relationship between these two actualities? Uh, reading B will leave it open. Either the actuality of color qua visible is a further actuality uh, beyond the actuality of color qua quality of body. Or these two actualities have the same weight qua actuality, but they are just two different states uh, of the actual color. And this um, nuances will determine, will change Avicenna's pos position significantly, as I will show later. And reading C, as I mentioned, will just render Avicenna's statement trivial, because um, if color as we see it refer to our mental representation, of course it is here and not there. So it, it is color as we see it is not the actual existent in the bodies. And I will claim that reading C can be very easily rejected because According to Avicenna's terminology, color only applies to colored body. So our eye, our mind, is not colored body. It's, uh, and we can tell from the text, too, that Avicenna is always talking about color in the body and not color in our mind. And the problem is uh, how to decide, from, uh, decide uh, between the first reading and the second reading. And here I can put it in another way. So the key issue at stake is the relationship between our perception of color and the, actual, the actuality of color, whether they are symmetrical or asymmetrical. For reading A, they are, not, uh, they are asymmetrical because uh, when we can talk about the actuality of color without the perception of color. And we, can, we cannot talk about our perception of color without the actuality of color. But reading B will hold that they are symmetrical. We can only talk about 
our perception of color with the actuality of color, and we can only talk about the actuality of color uh, uh, only when they are, uh, they are on actual perception of color. So he, this, different, this disti distinction may help you to understand better, appreciate better the difference br brought by these two readings. And we can further tell and uh, we can further examine Avicenna's position by the following question. Is color something out there which is independent of our act of perceiving it? Uh, according to my interpretation, reading A is the most appropriate to adopt, so that Avicenna's answer is yes. And we can compare Avicenna's position to a Protagorean mm -hmm. thesis, according to which if some object O appears to some perceiver P to have certain color C, then the object is so colored to the perceiver. And even put it stronger, the converse of PT, object O is colored, is colored, is so colored, it has color C only if and only if when object O appears C to some perceiver P. Avicenna will not accept this position because this position seems to imply and entail that whether some object has certain color is, decide, is totally decided by our mental activities. And I will find further support from Avicenna's definition of sight and color because Avicenna's definition of sight is sight in the primary sense is a power to perceive this, ob this quality. And color is this quality. Color is that quality by which when it is between a luminous thing and a receptive body of light, the luminous body will not execute luminous light in that body. This quality is color. Color is white and black. What is, most, uh, what is shocking is Avicenna's definition of sight and color is so externalized. It um, is, does not involve our perception of color at all. And uh, in his definition, the priority, uh, pri priority between sight and color is clear. He defined sight through color, not def he def no, rather, he def uh, it's not, he does not define color through sight. So color uh, enjoys some privilege or priority in the definition, so in explanation. So Avicenna explained our sight by refer to color, not by explaining the color by referring to our subjective perception of color. And his definition of color do not involve our perception of color. It seems color is just something out there and playing the causal role in the physical world. And this will be more, uh, much more clearer in text three. Avicenna's, uh, in the third page of your handout, and Avicenna's uh, general conception of sensation. For he claimed, for sensation is to be acted upon since it receives perceptible fo form from these organs, and it is a chain towards the resemblance of the perceptible in actuality, so the perceiver in actuality is like the perceptible in actuality, and the perceiver in its power is like the perceptible in its power. So since sensation is to be acted upon, so the object of sensation must uh, must be in actuality prior to the actuality of our senses. Therefore, color is already in its full actuality before we perceive it. Therefore, reading A is much more appropriate to adopt because it holds that whether we perceive color or not, color is just out there only uh, if it is illuminated. Here, uh, this leads us to Aristotle and Avicenna's general conception of color realism. <coughs> And we can conclude and characterize this position uh, more accurately by the following statement. Color is uh, an intrinsic and no non-reductible reductible quality possessed by the body, existentially independent of the perceivers <coughs> and perception. Color is also causally responsible for our perception of it. Color is prior to acts of perception in the explanation of color, it, uh, in the explanation of perception. Color are not to be identified as mere dispositions which affect perceivers in this way or otherwise to be defined in terms of the qualitative state they produce in the perceiver, as the scientists claim at the right beginning of our, of, of our talk. Aristotle and Avicenna will disagree. Colors of objects are themselves just as they appear to us. There is no gap between the reality of color and our cognition of color. 
color have some formal and materi material characteristic not being immediately evident in experience, but they can be grasped through further investigation and theorizing. I didn't mention this part in this lecture, but I will show in, uh, in, uh, in the paper, uh, talk about this in, in my paper in detail. And this, uh, this conclusion is drawn from uh, custom and I, with my modifica uh, modifications. Here, we, uh, I, will show, I will compare Aristotle and Avicenna's color re realism to that in the Descartes log tradition on color. And you can appreciate the difference better. According to this tradition, there is a viable and important distinction between color as it is in our experience and color as a quality actually possessed by physical objects. And we, as color perceivers, have a natural but mistaken tendency to think that objects have a certain kind of color which they do not, in fact, have. For Aristotle and Avicenna, we human beings, uh, uh, our cognition is a, uh, has its veracity. It, there's no deception in our perception. And I will, I will introduce uh, the famous Descartes' uh, Ken energy to you. According to Descartes, the blind man can also be said to see uh, with his can at hand. Because uh, to see is for the eye to, be, to, to receive the pressure from air, from the air object. And to touch is also for the hand to receive the pressure from the object. They are all, uh, they are all necessitated, uh, happened in, by the physical contact. So there's no essential and real difference between uh, the sense of touch and the sense of sight. But Aristotle and Avicenna will disagree. Uh, they will say there is a real modernity between our different senses. That means you cannot see color, and you cannot taste color, you cannot touch color, you can only see color, and you cannot see the flavor. You only taste the flavor. So what's the, uh, what's the deeper, uh, what's this ontological disagreement uh, means on why they come to different conclusions about the reality of color. And I will say this is because they have different world, mind and world view behind. According to Aristotle and Avicenna, the causation in our world, uh, the causation happened in our perception is a kind of an enabling causation. I will explain this more. And they are both optimistic about the human capacity to know about the external world. There is an essential connection between mind and world. As Avicenna claimed that our perception of color uh, will achieve some resemblance uh, of the object. So there is some formal identity or resemblance between our perception of object and the object. But for Descartes and Locke, for all, the, all these scientists, there is a huge gap between the content in the world and the content of our cognition. The world can be fully revealed in our cognition experience and knowledge of it. And uh, to Avicenna and Aristotle, it's not self-evident and certain at all that all acting upon and being affected, that is all causation, is necessitated by contact or touch. Avicenna's example is that God and angel's intellect causes uh, some event, not by touch or by physical contact. But to Descartes and Galileo, is the, the causation is only mechanistic causation. And color cannot play a causal role in the me mechanistic world. And all these senses, our senses, are just variations of the sense of touch, because sense of touch is the most typical for this physical contact. <coughs> I will give you a more vivid example to review the difference between these two kinds of causation. One is enabling, enabling causation, another is mechanistic causation. And to think about these two sentences. Nazi bombing shapes the London skyline, and St. Paul's shapes the London skylines. So what's the difference between these two shapes? Well, well, the first is Nazi bombing shapes the, the London skyline. It's more like the mechanistic causation. And the St. Paul's shapes the London skyline is more like the enabling causation, because St. Paul's not only shapes the uh, London skyline, but also constitu uh, constitutively and actively contribute to the content of the London skyline. So it makes its own contribution to it, not just 
making some uh, uh, making some change by force. But Nazis bombing ships the land and skylines is achieved by merely force. So <coughs> I will conclude by the following by thinking about the merits of Arizona's color realism. The first merit is preserves our common sense that there's veracity in our, in our human cognition. And also its argumentative strategy of Arizona's defense of color real reality is attractive because we can not we can also uh, we cannot demonstrate that color exists, but but uh, Avicenna and Aristotle will, will, say, will say that the burden is on the other side, that uh, they need to prove that color do not exist, and they need to uh, the scientists and the other philosophers need to prove that color do not exist consistently. That's a problem. So that's why Avicenna and also Aristotle's uh, argumentative strategy is mainly diagnostic, and they will try to show their, the, uh, the other rival theories will bring uh, will bring some unacceptable and absurd consequences, which undermines <coughs> our common sense. And Avicenna's uh, approach is also kind of naturalized and externalized epistemology, and it's just uh, it's just uh, he just describes the mechanism of our cognition, and this description will lead to justification. And this is quite different from the internalized or Cartesian uh, conception of justification. But, mm. And Avicenna's and Aristotelian science of color incorporate the color philosophy and color science very well. To them, there's no gap between our talking about the psychology of color <coughs> and our physical discussion of color. They, uh, they both will contribute our knowledge of color and our color experience. There's no huge gap. But to the Cartesian tradition, that color experience is something solipsistic, and it's some uh, it need always need the uh, subjective uh, subjective reflection or focus on the private uh, experience of color. And there will be further exploration of color reality because color itself is so complex. It's not not only involve color in the object. It's also involve how the how color information trans transmit to our mind and what happened in our mind. There are both historical, philological works uh, need us to do. We need to figure out what's Avicenna's, what are Avicenna's sources for this color, for his whole discussion of color perception, in addition to the Greek uh, tradition. And um, what's the color sciences uh, in Avicenna's time, because there are a lot the great significant uh, great development in the uh, in various sciences in the time of Avicenna comparing to that in antiquity. And uh, there are also another very complex problem about common color semantics. In Arabic, some words, if you look up in the dictionary, it's, it uh, will give you different explanations. Like if some uh, some words like kuhbatun, it will refer, both refer, the dictionary will explain that it both refers to the color of dust also is referred to color of blood. So you might be very confused. <laughs> they might be very, uh, there might be some different conception of color which uh, uh, possessed by them, uh, used, uh, employed by them. And uh, their conception of color uh, uh, to, to reflect on the, the different conception of color will contribute or shed new light uh, to our contemporary discussion of, of, co of color reality. And actually these problems are, um, uh, nowadays, the uh, scientists, neuroscientists, and uh, uh, psychologists and physicists are still working on these uh, topics. And uh, the other is, uh, uh, aspect is philosophical. And uh, if it, like I, as I showed, that will, it will stimulate our further expand, uh, impl explore exploration of the causation and representation happen in sense perception. And uh, how different is the biological causation is from other, uh, other physical causation. And uh, uh, what is the metaphysical groundwork? Uh, um, obviously, the Aristotelian science and Avicennian science has the quite different metaphysical groundwork from that of our modern science. And uh, we need also to explain the content, the source or origin of content of our cognition. 
And here, the last slide is some advertisement for my further uh, PhD dissertation. And uh, what we are, uh, we are talking about today is just part of the whole story. And I just I show it and uh, to welcome all of your uh, any kind of comments, and if you are uh, if you are interested in any of any one of this uh, topic, please keep in contact with me. I'm very looking forward to hear your uh, uh, insight about this, and I leave my email in the handout. And yeah, please uh, uh, feel free uh, yeah, to uh, to discuss. And thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for your patience. <laughs> I assume by comments this is a uh, polite Chinese way of saying that he would be happy to answer questions. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, I always have a question. Okay, just common sense. Uh, what what information was available? I've never been around a colorblind person, but yeah. I guess they're fairly common. Yeah. So if you say. Uh, color is real, yeah. then why is, and we can perceive it or know about it, how does it happen that two different people mm -hmm. could call one thing two different colors? Yeah. Uh, what would Avicenna say to that? Uh, okay. According to my uh, according to my observation, that this, uh, as I said, color issues come uh, is involve various layers and aspect of uh, of uh, uh, sciences and uh, human experience. And uh, according to my observation, the color semantics, like uh, when we say uh, uh, the single one color is perceived by two different people as two different colors, and this actually is an ambiguous uh, question, and we will. Uh, uh, need other uh, further clarification at that uh, what's the difference between these two people is uh, their uh, their conception of different color or the uh, the qualia or the most private quality of their um, of their uh, experience of color actually it's, it's very controversial even in our modern uh, psychology and color science that uh, scientists are arguing about whether uh, the uh, inverse of the spec spectra that means uh, uh, two different people. One is uh, seeing, actually seeing green, and the other is seeing uh, blue. But they both use green to describe this uh, this color, uh, and they can, uh, uh, as a language user, they are both sufficient, and they, this will not cause any problem for them. But their most private experience of this color are different. Mm. I don't think I can answer this question uh, very well, and uh, the, it needs a lot of corporate cooperation between philosophy and and uh, various sciences. But I uh, just according to my observation, these uh, these uh, problems do not uh, do not concern uh, Aristotle and Avicenna. They, um, but why not? Uh, why 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 would yeah. they? And actually, uh, their conception uh, when we talk uh, when we talk about color. Uh, what do they mean by color is quite different from our perception of color. So, and I think that's a very uh, vital question for, for my further uh, <laughs> studies uh, to answer. But uh, by now, I do not have a, a very good uh, question. And actually, the, their color real realism is, is to emphasize that um, uh, there is very intimate connection between the uh, reality and our cognition that when I say I say this table is white, and it is the case that this table is white. This table is white, this content is identical. Um, they just want, want to emphasize this aspect. Um, okay. Yeah, just uh, sorry about that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, to push actually that yeah. question. So I think it's a bit kind of to say that basically um, to have it, mm. it doesn't need to have a perception of color necessarily. Mm -hmm. For example, imagine that a person never had any perception of mm -hmm. green color. Mm -hmm. And we give them like a green object yeah. and tell them, okay, go find a green object. So that yeah. person can basically, based on resemblance, yeah. say that, okay, it's this and this is this. So they're both green. Yeah. So um, how, how can Elisina explain that? Mm. 
uh, yeah, iPhone. Because when, when yeah. we say that, sorry, so yeah. we say that color <coughs> is not necessarily a property of mind, it's not necessarily mind that mind dependent and can exist yeah. um, independent from our perception of our mind. Yeah, uh, um, I will say, uh, Avicenna will, uh, what they uh, emphasize that there must be something very steady and abiding there and keep causing uh, us, our experience of, of it consistently. And we, they will say that it is not, on, uh, not because uh, um, mm, uh, uh, both Aristotle and Avicenna will emphasize that we must talk about color in the normal condition. So this normal condition is very vital to this their discussion. That if you say someone is a uh, um, someone is uh, just different from us, we'll say that uh, abnormal condition. That we are talking about the uh, normal condition of our uh, of our uh, color experience. And also they will emphasize it is because the object have always have the same color that you see it differently in different conditions. It is not because it has different color in different conditions. If it do not have some consistent, consistent, and uh, col uh, uh, color in it, abiding color in it, you will not experience different color in different conditions, or different people will not. But uh, yeah, this uh, and uh, actually in the why color is so complex is uh, our modern philosophy and scientists find that actually the physical property and our experience of uh, color is not one to one. Is uh, is multiple to multiple. That means the same p physical property can cause different uh, experience, and the different physical property can cause the same uh, color experience. And I don't I don't think uh, Aristotle and Avicenna will have the have this uh, empirical evidence in mind. And uh, I think uh, f just by uh, for now, I just think they have different concerns. And especially as we as we say. Uh, their discussion is very metaphysical in spirit. Uh, they, are, they care more about the metaphysical uh, groundwork of uh, this discussion. And, and that's I, uh, why we need to uh, look, look uh, into the various color sciences and what uh, empirical evidence Aristotle and Avicenna uh, have in their time. Yeah, that's a very, very valuable and uh, complex question. I, don't not, I do not think I can give you a satisfying answer. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, as far as I remember, the European theory of color started basically with uh, like Newton and Goethe and the Confucius in the late 17th, 18th century. Yeah. Mostly with looking at the prism and observing that the white light can be decomposed into components of different colors mm -hmm. and trying to interpret it in various ways. So Newton came up with Cartesian theory of light and uh, Fabrianski with the wave theory and so on. Yeah. And I see that uh, Avicenna already paid attention to the fact that you do have the light sort of decomposed into a different component if say, you look at the map of a pigeon. But other than that, were they aware of, for example, prisms, or did they think about stuff like rainbow, where obviously the sunlight is decomposed into components? Was it something of, of concern to them in Avicenna? Sorry, I don't get your uh, okay. comment. Well, I, I mean, yeah. from the point of view of the pure European physics. Ah, European physics. A very important yeah. thing, a very important thing, <coughs> based on which much of the thinking about light and light perception took place. Yeah. It was a decomposition of the white light yeah. into colored components yeah. when going through a prism, a glass prism. Yeah. yeah. And soon enough, people realized that the, the rainbow was the same yeah, thing rainbow. because of light. Uh, Oh, okay. di different kinds of lights uh, are refracted differently. Yeah. When passing through a um, through a little sphere of water. Yeah. And uh, with a drop of water. So based on that, yeah. they started de developing their theories. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, this kind of experimental fact, I mean, the fact that the white light actually can be decomposed into components. Yeah. Was it something that people in even Sina's time? Yeah, they. Uh, I mean, you mentioned pigeons, for example. Yes. The, the fibers, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, 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 the Greek concept of color is not uh, as us as the uh, pre modern time. And uh, for them, color is only white and black. And this white and black may have different connotations uh, from our conception of white and black. Mm, and uh, different uh, in intermediate color is just a combination 
of this whiteness and blackness. So basically, it's like a, a two-point model, white-black, as opposed to the three components. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and some, uh, some tradition even have the uh, five basic uh, components of color, uh, five color, basic color. And uh, the, but I, I want to say that the point is, uh, even in our modern science, you cannot claim the light is white. And uh, actually, color is something generated in the in interaction between the light and uh, the body. Well, uh, of course, I mean, the, the, yeah. the, the three components, projection, yes. But intrinsically, of course, the, the light can be uh, subject to a spectral analysis, and you, you can yeah. fully, fully represent it, for example, as a, yeah. well, as, as a vector and a function aspect. It is just like a, a, a projection to a three-dimensional space because of how our, our eyes yeah. are designed. Yeah, I, I, uh, I quite agree, uh, I, I agree but uh, I think Avicenna's, uh, the, the disagreement between uh, this ontolo uh, ontological disagreement between them is Avicenna and Aristotle will, will, will regard this, uh, uh, this explanation you offer as insufficient. That uh, uh, they will say the, the pre-modern scientists, they, they are right in their empirical observation, but they go too far. That you can, you know, yes, you have some uh, observation of the light can be ref uh, reflected into different, uh, uh, different uh, light, uh, different colors, but that does not entail that color is identical to light or to wavelengths, and which is most prevalent conception uh, 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 we find in all our textbooks of physics. That color is just different uh, light with different wavelengths. And uh, for philosopher, you cannot go that far. You cannot claim the identity between color and uh, this wavelength of these mat mathematical entities. And, uh, and that will be also be very insufficient to explain what happened, uh, why here th there need a radical translation in our language, or there need a radical transition from the world to our mind. Why here is only some, uh, some uh, bald or naked a physical entity, but here we have this complex and uh, vivid subjective subjective uh, experience. And uh, they will say the, uh, the modern explanation will leave the uh, unacceptable and very difficult to explain, very puzzling uh, gap be between this. That you're right, uh, Newton and uh, Maxwell and Boy, um, uh, Galileo, they are both right in their some uh, empirical evidence, but they are met the the metaphysical ground they, they employ is wrong. That's a, that's a disagreement, I think. Okay, so like, there's a difference between the physics and the metaphysics. Yeah, that's a point. Uh, that's a job of all, all of us uh, <laughs> yeah, to do, <laughs> to justify. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. <coughs> so um, I want to ask you about um, contact causality. Yeah. You say that for Descartes, um, all the senses are reducible to touch. And so the pressure of the air on the eye yeah. is analogous or, or strongly analogous mm -hmm. to the pressure of the cane in the hand of the blind man. Um, okay, and then uh, in the Aristotelian Avicennian tradition, um, we see color and we taste flavor yeah. and we touch, touch texture. Um, and the, uh, there is no strong analogy there. Mm. On the other hand, for Aristotle and Avicenna, ex well, in the, for Aristotle, certainly, and for Avicenna in, a, in the physical world, <clears throat> touch is always, there's always, causality cannot happen without contact. Mm. Now, yeah, granted, there's angels and spiritual causal things, mm -hmm. but in terms of the cosmological world in which we live, mm -hmm. could you say a little bit more about um, how the contact causality would would work in in Avicenna? So, if there's a color off in the distance um, and our eyes somehow are affected by that color, what is the what is the contact that's happening there yeah. that allows that to happen? And how is that different than Descartes? Blind man with the cane. Yeah. And that is the, so we were talking about this photo the other day. This engraving is this blind man. Is this the first use of a uh, of a helper dog? <laughs> <laughs> but if this blind man has a dog in the 17th century. I'm just. just the dog to seems that. to be asleep. Yeah, not a good not a good helper dog. So um, yeah, so 
Could you talk a little bit more about contact causality and yeah. how that works in Arizona? Okay, well, that's a billion, billion. Uh, that's a billion there. Uh, that's a billion question. The million dollar question. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, uh, I think that constitutes uh, the motivation of Aristotle and uh, Avicenna to, to say that our perception is uh, not merely a physical event. That it was, of course, they will uh, admit that we need some corporeal, corporeal organs and all these physical elements in our perception. But it's not merely a physical event. That's why Aristotle and Avicenna want to emphasize that perception is happened by, uh, by actual uh, by uh, perception, it's happened by perfection or actual actualization, so, and that's uh, maybe half of the achievement Aristotle achieved. Uh, his accomplishment is uh, is based on the, his famous disting distinction between actuality and uh, potentiality, and it's very hard to. But there are some, I think, some uh, very insightful intuition that some of the change happened in the physical world is so uh, uh, obvious and um, and so radical and. Uh, com uh, compared compared with the change happening in perception, like uh, uh, I am white now, and but uh, tomorrow I will be uh, be black, and uh, but uh, and this change is different from uh, I I have a grammatical knowledge, but I'm not using it. But uh, uh, I have the uh, ability of of giving a speech, but I'm not uh, using it. But now I'm using actually using it. So what the change happened in before? Uh, before and after, I am actually using my ability um, of giving a speech, and these two kind of change might be might uh, must be different. So, uh, not all the changes or uh, events in our world happen by the former kind kind of change. They are might, um, and this uh, uh, that this also um, I think this intuition is also uh, part of the that gentleman's intuition about. Uh, why we still need uh, it's the it's the physical explanation of our perception. All the uh, the work uh, which is doing by the neuroscientists and physicists is not sufficient for explanation. Um, yeah, they they are still quarreling about this. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think I can give a, a example. Uh, uh, give a very satisfying explanation, but I think. Uh, mm, uh, as, I'm, as we can see in the text three that Avicenna said, uh, uh, we, uh, when we perceive that color, uh, uh, we do not take that color literally in our, in, in our sight. We take something uh, off, and our perception does not change that object. So, but we also get something from it. So what do you think? There's no Evident, no obvious and no radical change happened in the in the object before and after it has been perceived by us, but we still get something. So what do we get? And uh, um, to them, we get the form of the uh, the visible object. But what do they mean by form? And uh, this is uh, maybe kind of half of the story. Um, told by this Aristotelian tradition. What, uh, all, all the Asian philosophy and medieval philosophy, uh, their uh, holomorphism, uh, what, is, what do they mean by form? And this is a battlefield for many scholars and uh, to, to argue about uh, what happened in, in the visual perception, what do we get? And different people, different scholars div devise different models and to make it more accessible to our modern mind. Yes, they have some uh, formal identity model and uh, encoding model. As the color encodes something, and our mind is discode uh, that. And uh, and also uh, uh, the re ratio um, model. Just uh, it's, I do not want to think of Dr. Pearson. Uh, want, uh, I don't. I do not think I can give a satisfying uh, explanation. But uh, to them. Uh, um, Actually, I, I, I think they, they do not uh, want to prove or demonstrate that there is this kind of different, uh, different uh, causation of, uh, in addition to the physical context. They just want to say, if you deny uh, there is such a kind of uh, contact or causation, you will have our common sense uh, undermined, and you will have much burden um, on your side, and you, you, have, you will have many things especially for our mental activities. You cannot explain that well. And I think that's a disagreement uh, 
concerning their some deeper philosophical intuitions. That, um, yeah, that's all I can say for now. You are an uh, Aristotle uh, expert on Aristotelian tradition, so you know better than I about this, this puzzles uh, left, all this mess left by Aristotle and his commentators. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. What do you think the scholar, the perception of scholar going to the perception of other artists by our differences, like here, for example? Yeah. What, is the, what, what, dif what difference does it make to the scholar? Why scholar is different? Yeah. Uh, I mean, um, we, can, we can perceive air, but yeah. we cannot see air. Is there an argument like that? Um, Same as the scholar. Uh, so, if not, why is the scholar so different? Uh, yeah, to, uh, I think maybe. Uh, I'll try to ans answer this, that to Aristotle and Avicenna, uh, uh, each senses has its proper object, and it also has some, it's uh, uh, accidental object, and also has some, um, uh, uh, has these uh, two uh, kinds of object. For sight, it's a uh, proper object, that means only, which can be only perceived by sight, is color and phosphorescence. And Aristotle says that something has no name, has some shining things, it's different from color. But the most common object or proper, co proper object of sight is color. And we do not actually see air. But to Avicenna and Aristotle, we can see air. But uh, accident uh, accidentally, like we can, we can see air by seeing color. Um, and air, you can see, is uh, more concrete, is, uh, have body or elements involved. But color is something more elusive, that um, it seems uh, cannot color. Uh, that's Aristotle and Avicenna want to prove that uh, the major part of their uh, refutation to the atomist is that the incorporeality of color, that color is not body, and light is not body. And the atomist conception and other rival theories is quite different. They want to prove that light is body, and color is also body. This because there are only bodies in our world. But uh, Aristotle and Avicenna is different. Yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll ask another <laughs> question. Uh, I, I'm not an expert on uh, Aristotle or Avicenna and these guys. I'm just taking it from an ordinary person's experience. And then they read what Avicenna has to say. Uh, one, uh, what is the role of light? Yeah. Uh, we have all had the experience of looking at a colored object when the sun is high in the sky and when the sun starts to go down and it gets red and orange. Yeah. Why, it seems as if the thing we're looking at changes color. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what, why haven't they talked about, why doesn't he talk more about light and yeah. it's, role here? Uh, I think he, he has uh, plenty of uh, explanation and that uh, concern Avicenna much that uh, in different places. And uh, in addition to the, his uh, uh, third book of his Kitab Nefs, uh, he talked about color and light. And he also uh, need, uh, want to distinguish color from light because someone say light is just color, the manifestation of color, or color is just the manifestation of light. And he also had other dis uh, more physical explanation of light and color in his other books, like the generation and corruption, and his. Uh, right. And uh, yeah. but why do, why does he why can, yeah, do he I can. call it a different color? What I'm looking at, according to the light, whether the sun's here or there. Because uh, uh, to them, uh, because the condition of the uh, vision changed because in. During the day, light, uh, um, the temperature of the air or the, uh, the, the components of the, of the air changed uh, during the, and uh, they, uh, their explanation is so color. So my experience yeah. of color depends highly on the conditions of the air uh, or whatever. They will say uh, that it's not, uh, it's, uh, for, uh, by now it is not a uh, uh, a merely uh, problem of our experience. Uh, when you want to explain it, Avicenna and Aristotle will say that um, some ordinary people will be puzzled, but for the experts, he know more knowledge <laughs> about uh, the meteor meteorology and uh, 
the, the other uh, sciences, and he can explain that well, because to them, uh, Aristotle and Avicenna explain different uh, colors by the earthy element, they say. Like, uh, why uh, during the sunset, uh, Bloomington's, uh, color, uh, the color of Bloomington's sunset is different from Los Angeles, because the elements in their atmosphere are different. That also are, are modern scientific explanation, because some, some area has more dust, or some uh, industrial uh, uh, there, and oh, yeah, it's <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yes, yes, he's studied in Beijing, so he knows this well. Okay. No, but the point is that if, if, if color is a real thing yeah. in the object, yeah. then it seems pretty weird that the kind of light you shine on it affects our experience of the color we label it. The two, uh, Aristotle and Avicenna, uh, the sun is not a colored body. The sun is a luminous body. Yeah, yeah. I know that. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry, okay. sorry for that. All right, it, it is one o'clock, or near enough as doesn't matter. And uh, clearly, we are going to need to let Suleiman finish his dissertation and invite him back so he can answer the rest of these questions. But until then, let's thank him again for his presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you for all patience. Yes. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your patience and your questions and your insightful comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I apologize for having been late. I teach at the law school on Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, and that interfered with my getting here on time. If you haven't signed in with your email, please do because we need to ask that to report even if you've signed in before. Uh, you can indicate whether you'd like to receive uh, emails from us or not. Thank you very much. I was thank, thank you, you Ambassador Easter.